Well, if you are a visitor here, well, welcome. Um, normally what we do is we take some passage of the Bible and we read that passage and look at what it says. But occasionally uh, we have a message where we take our statement of faith and take one section of our statement of faith and look at what it says about what we believe. And that's what we're doing today. We're looking at Article 4 of our Statement of Faith. It is about salvation. So we're going to be looking at a lot of different parts of the Bible and a lot of different things going through and looking at what do we believe as Christians about salvation. We're just saying about salvation. So what is it we believe about salvation? So on the screen, I'll have the text of the Statement of Faith. It's also in the Bible app, if you did uh, open that up. But here we go. You can follow along as I read from our Statement of Faith, Article 4, on salvation. It says, Salvation involves the redemption of the whole man and is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who, by his own blood, obtained eternal redemption for the believer. In its broadest sense, salvation includes regeneration, justification, sanctification, and glorification. There is no salvation apart from personal faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. A, regeneration or the new birth is a work of God's grace whereby believers become new creatures in Christ Jesus. It is a change of heart performed by the Holy Spirit through conviction of sin, to which the sinner responds in repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are inseparable experiences of grace. Repentance is a genuine turning from sin toward God. Faith is the acceptance of Jesus Christ and commitment of the entire personality to him as Lord and Savior. B, justification is God's gracious and full acquittal upon principles of his righteousness of all sinners who repent and believe in Christ. Justification brings the believer unto a relationship of peace and favor with God. C, sanctification is the experience beginning in regeneration by which the believer is set apart to God's purposes and is enabled to progress toward moral and spiritual maturity through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Growth and grace should continue throughout the regenerate person's life. And D, glorification is the culmination of salvation and is the final blessed and abiding state of the redeemed. So that's the statement of faith. And we're going to go through and look at the parts of that. Um, If you have in the Bible app or if you uh, go on to our resources page. We have a resources page? We do. On our resources page of uclakeland.org slash resources. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can find our entire statement of faith. Underneath Article 4 and that text we just read, there are a series of Bible passages where you can get more information and where we base this on. We're going to look at some of those, but not all of those this morning. But the first point we're going to look at is that the Christian life begins when we are regenerated or born again. Well, what does that mean? It means, first, regeneration is when we are born again. Saying we are born again is just another way of saying that we have been regenerated. It's a new beginning to life. We have moved from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And we can see this, for example, in John 3. It says, This man came to him, Jesus, at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So now this is where Christians get the common phrase that we must be born again. And it's where we get the idea of being a born again Christian. Jesus said here, only those who are born again can enter heaven. In other words, something has to change about us. We don't uh, begin naturally as people on our way to heaven. Apart from Jesus, we are heading in the wrong direction. And we need to start over to be regenerated. And that same idea is echoed by Peter in 1 Peter. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So our new birth is an act of mercy. And that means that the new birth not only changed us, but it changed us from something that wasn't good. We were heading in the wrong direction. We were in sin. And God saved us from that sin through this new birth. The new birth isn't something we deserved or we earned. It was an act of mercy. God saved us from our original condition. He gave us this new birth. Now, John also wrote about this, uh, this Christian life being born again. John said, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. So to believe and trust in Jesus is to be born again. And it's being born of God, which means God caused it. God is the one who did the work. And that's important because we couldn't do it ourselves because we were dead in our sins. Paul described this in his letter to the Ephesian church. He said, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. So again, God made us alive while we were dead. So he did the work because dead people can't do anything. We were dead in our trespasses, our sins, and we had no way out of that on our own. So that means that regeneration is an act of God's grace. We did not earn that. And this isn't just a New Testament concept. It was something promised in the Old Testament. Last week, uh, we talked about how Jesus said the entire Bible was about him. He said the law, the prophets, and the Psalms were all about him, making promises about him. Uh, Well, one of those prophets who promised the coming Messiah, Jesus, was Ezekiel. And through Ezekiel, God said this, I will also sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. So five times in that brief little passage there, God says, I will do something. He will make us clean. He will cleanse us from our sin. He will change our hearts. He will put his spirit in us. So this is not something that we did, we earned, or anything like that. It all comes from God. And we see that in the book of Acts as well. It says, a God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatria, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. So Lydia comes to faith in Jesus, but why does she do that? Does she just on her own think, oh, this makes sense, I'm going to go with this. Well, no, God opened her heart. God changed her heart so that she would believe and be saved. And Paul wrote about this in Ephesians as well. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive in Christ. Even though you were dead in your trespasses, you were saved by grace. We looked at that before, and again, we see that he made us alive. He opened our hearts. He changed us. We were dead. God brought us to life as an act of grace. Now, we did, though, believe. So it seems like we did something, right? Like, If you're a Christian, at some point you chose to believe. You put your faith. You confessed your sin. So it seems like we did something. Well, yes, of course, we did do that. But we're going to look at how that comes about as an act of God. But also, regeneration comes with repentance. That's what we were just talking about. You confessed your sins. You trusted in Jesus. So that is part of salvation. So now, if you're not a Christian and you're here, or you didn't grow up in church surrounded by all sorts of Christian lingo, Uh, the word repentance might not be very clear to you. Maybe you've heard Christians talk about repenting. Maybe you haven't. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard of it. What does that mean? 
It's not a word that's used much outside of religious context anymore. It's kind of an old word. But it just means to turn away from something and toward something else. In this context, it's turning away from our sin and turning toward God. So that means admitting, confessing that we are sinners. But then that leads to the question, what is sin? Well, sin is anything you've thought or done that goes against the moral nature and commands of God. It's any time you go against the will of God. So any time you did something that you knew was wrong, that was sin. And repentance begins with admitting that we are sinners. We've done things and thought things that go against the will of God. And once we admit that, we want to turn away from that sin and turn toward God. So we admit that sin is evil and we turn toward God, seeking his will and his goodness. That is what repentance is. And that's what Jesus came to call us to do. Jesus told us in the Gospel of Luke, for example, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So he's come to call us to repent. Or we can see later in Luke, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Or those 18 that the Tower of Siloam fell on and killed, do you think they were more sinful than all the other people who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. So Jesus is coming, telling us there's an urgency and importance to repenting. On our own, we are headed in the wrong direction. We've already seen that. But Jesus is here telling us that that direction leads to death. If we continue on that direction, we will perish just as much as the people who were killed by a tower falling on them. Sin leads to death. But Jesus actually came to die in our place. That is how we are saved. Jesus also said to them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So Jesus came to die in our place. And then he rose from the dead, defeating death and offering us eternal life through his work. But even more than that, he now calls his followers to share that good news with others, to proclaim his name throughout the nations, throughout the world. And to share the gospel means to call people to repentance, what he came to do. We can't call people to Jesus' forgiveness without telling them that they have sin to be forgiven and that they need to turn away from that sin and to trust in Jesus. Now, there are two ways that uh, churches and individual Christians have messed this up historically. Uh, some try to minimize the whole concept of sin. They think, you know, talking about sin and judgment is kind of a downer. It is not a good story. So they emphasize something more positive sounding. For example, they might just say, you know, God loves you and he loves you just the way you are and God has a plan for you and you should, you know, come to church and hear about God so that you can live this great life. You can have your best life now, that kind of thing. Well, the motivation to come to Jesus then isn't about forgiveness or anything like that. It's about getting this greater life that God has planned for you. And the problem with that is it doesn't call people to Jesus as Lord, but rather Jesus as some sort of lottery. I mean, people play the lottery because they want a better life. They might come to Jesus because they think he's going to make their life better. But that's not the gospel. The second way individuals and churches can mess this up is by proclaiming forgiveness of sin without any real repentance. They say that Jesus forgives you completely just the way you are. You don't actually have to turn away from your sin. But Jesus demands that not only that you admit that you are a sinner and that you need salvation, but that you turn away from sin. That is what repentance is. Not just admitting, but turning away and toward God. You have to realize that your sin is evil and that you have to want to reject that sin. Now, of course, if you've been a Christian for a while, you know we still struggle with sin. But it's in a much different way than we did before we were Christians. <clears throat> now, repentance is required for salvation. So when God opens your heart to respond to the gospel, he gives you that repentance. He gives you the desire to repent. That's part of what it means to be born again. When we come to Jesus, we're admitting that we lived as rebels against God 
or as Ephesians 2 says, we lived according to our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. When God changes our hearts, he gives us the ability to turn away from those sinful desires and our rebellion against God. And he gives us the ability instead to turn to him and to submit to him and his moral law and his will. This is what it means to be regenerated or to be born again. God changes us and he recreates us. And that leads to point number two. When we trust in Jesus, we are justified or forgiven in the eyes of God. And we've already seen that our natural state is we're sinners. We've rebelled against God. We're enemies of God, as the Bible says. And so we deserve God's judgment. And that means that the good news of Jesus has to be him taking away our guilt. And that's what it means to be justified. It means to have no guilt, to be just, to be righteous, to be good. But how do we go from being sinners to being innocent? Well, oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry. we are justified by grace through faith alone. And we can see this, for example, in Titus. God saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. And then there's this passage in Ephesians. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. In both of these cases, we, what we do to be saved is simply to have faith or trust in Jesus, in the work of Jesus. So it seems like we're doing something. We're having faith. We're trusting in Jesus. We're choosing to follow him. That seems to make sense. But even then, that is the work of God because God is the one who changed our hearts and gave us this gift of faith. So yes, we are trusting in Jesus, but that trust came as a gift. So we can see, whoops, let's see. Oh. Well, it's supposed to say justification is entirely the work of Christ. Jesus took away our guilt. He took away our sin. He took our sin upon himself and he died in our place. Let me see. Maybe I went the wrong way. Whoops. There we go, okay. Justification is entirely the work of Christ. And we can see this in 1 Peter, for example. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So he took our sins upon his body, and he died in our place. Or as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he made the one God, God made the one who did not know sin, Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that is the good news of Jesus, that he took our sin upon himself. He died in our place. But the good news of Jesus even goes beyond that, because justification unites us with Christ. Jesus didn't just remove our sin. He did remove our sin, and that is a good thing. But beyond that, he brought us into a relationship with him. And we can see this in Philippians 3. More than that, I also consider everything to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. So because of Jesus' work, we can know Christ and be united with him, be found in him. And then there's Galatians 2. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In Romans, for if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So now all three of these passages make clear that with our justification comes a relationship with Jesus. We're united with Jesus. 
And notice the certainty of these passages. For example, Romans said there that if we have been united with him in his death, in other words, if he did take our sins upon himself and die in our place, then we will certainly also be united with him in the resurrection in heaven. So that means that justification is a one-time completed act. When Jesus died, he took our sins upon himself. He removed our guilt. But what sins did he take away? He took all our sins, past, present, and future. Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. And we are justified or made right before God through this by trusting in this one act. And when we trust in his death, we are united with him. And we're trusting in him for the forgiveness, again, of all of our sins, even our future sins. So our salvation at this point isn't dependent on us being good enough from now on. It's not like Jesus died and forgave all your past sins when you didn't know better, but now you know Jesus, so you, you better get your act together and be good. No, Jesus died for all of your sins, past, present, and future. And we're told this, for example, in Hebrews. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Now the word sanctified here means to be made holy, to be separated, set apart as belonging to God. When we trust in Jesus, we are united with him and we belong to him. When we trust in him, we're entrusting ourselves to him. We're trusting him not only as our savior, but as our Lord, our God. Now remember, to repent means to turn away from sin and to turn to God. So we're recognizing his authority as God. And once we have been sanctified, set apart, we belong to Jesus, then that's a permanent state. But you might wonder, what happens if after you've turned toward God, you turn back away from him? What happens if you lose your faith? Well, you won't. If your heart has been changed by God, then you won't lose your faith. Do you think that God changed your heart and brought you to faith? And then from that point on is sitting there saying, well, I hope he keeps it. That's not how it works. God isn't powerful enough to change your heart and bring you to faith and then going to turn around and say, I hope you're now strong enough to keep your faith. In fact, the same spirit that changed your heart is the spirit who's going to keep you in your faith. And that's point number three. The Holy Spirit's work in our lives sanctifies us or makes us more like Jesus over time. So first, remember... That sanctification means you have been made holy. You have been separated as belonging to God. To be sanctified means to be made holy for God. When we come to faith in Jesus, we are set apart. And we can see this in 1 Corinthians, for example. To the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord, or Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Now, notice, notice that here, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and calling them sanctified, along with everyone else in the world who trusts in Jesus. Now, to be a follower of Jesus means that you're sanctified. All followers of Jesus are sanctified. You are saints. Saint is just a word that comes from sanctified. That means people who are holy and set apart. Now, this opening passage here from Corinthians, Paul's writing, is important because if you're familiar with the letter to the Corinthian church, if you know what comes after this, Paul is going to talk about how this church is full of sin. There are a lot of problems in the Corinthian church, and yet Paul says that they are sanctified. They are saints, just as much as any Christian anywhere in the world. The fact that these people are still in sin, doing some really outlandish things, didn't change their salvation. But Paul goes on to say that their sin doesn't define them anymore. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and some of you used to be like this. He lists some sins and he says, some of you used to be like this. 
but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So Paul just listed some sins that separate people from God, and then he wrote that the Corinthian Christians used to be like that, but they're not anymore. Why aren't they like that anymore? Because they've been washed, they've been sanctified, justified by Jesus. But here's the thing. In this letter, Paul is describing how some of them are still doing some of these things. And not only are they doing these, they're tolerating other people doing these, and even encouraging that sometimes. But Paul says that they've been forgiven and they've been changed. Once they have been forgiven and changed, they're no longer guilty, even of these current and future sins. Jesus died once and for all. But does that mean that then they're free to keep sinning? Which is what some of them were saying. They were encouraging sin by saying, well, you've been forgiven, so go for it. Sin all you want. Well, no, that is not what Paul is saying. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you can continue to sin anymore. What it does mean is that when you're confronted with that sin, God is going to continue working in you and bringing you back to repentance. While they're trusting in Jesus, God is still working in them and sanctifying them as an ongoing process. So Paul can be sure that when he writes to them, because they are sanctified, because they are in Christ, that he can confront them with their sin and they will repent and trust in Jesus. So, sanctification means the Spirit is making you holy. <clears throat> we can see this continuing on in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. So even when we're saved, we still struggle with sin. We still engage in sin, but God is working in us, changing us over time, transforming us to be more like Jesus. God's still working in us through that spirit who changed our heart initially. And because we're being transformed, Paul can write this letter to them in confidence, saying that they are saints, and they are not like these other sinners anymore in the sense that they are going to continue in that sin. They're not defined by their sin. Instead, they're defined by their relationship with God, and he can call them to repentance and trusting in God. And that leads to the last point. Ultimately, the Christian will be glorified with Jesus forever. This point, uh, we're actually going to go over more later in our series to the Statement of Faith. It's Article 10 of our Statement of Faith about the end, what's going to happen when we're all in heaven. But for now, there's two things that are important to cover. First, when we die, we will immediately be with Jesus in heaven. Uh, we see this, uh, for example, in the famous story of Jesus on the cross. And he's talking to a thief who's on the cross next to him. And that thief asked Jesus to remember him when Jesus enters heaven. And here's what it says. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. When this man died, he immediately went to heaven with Jesus. Or as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, in fact, we are confident and we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So Paul juxtaposes being in your body alive or being in heaven with Jesus. The understanding there is to be apart from your body, to die, is to be with Jesus. And he makes a similar comparison in Philippians for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So once we die, we go to heaven, but our bodies will stay behind on earth. To be separated from the body is to be with Jesus. But even that separation is temporary. So the next thing, is that ultimately we will be physically transformed in heaven with our bodies. If we look at 1 Corinthians, listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. 
For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place, death has been swallowed up in victory, where death is your victory, where death is your sting. So one day our bodies will be resurrected at the end too, and we will spend eternity with our resurrected and perfected incorruptible bodies. Our bodies will be incorruptible, so there will be no more death. Death will have been defeated. No more disease, no more disability, no more sore backs when you wake up in the morning. Our bodies are currently very mortal, but one day they will not be. We will die, but one day we'll be given new, resurrected, immortal bodies, and death will be defeated. That is the promise that we have in Jesus, a promise guaranteed by his death and his resurrection. So what does this all mean for us if we're Christians? Well, if you have repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, then you have been regenerated. If you're a Christian, you've been baptized, that baptism symbolizes your dying with Christ, him taking your sin, and you dying to your sin, and then being raised again into a new life, to be born again. That's what baptism symbolizes. Your old self has been buried and your new self has been raised. If you're a Christian, you have been justified once and for all. You were sanctified, you were made holy, brought into a relationship with God. You belong to God. God is still working in you. He's still making you more like Jesus over time. And one day you will be in heaven glorified and perfected forever. But now what if you're not a Christian and you're here? If you've come here this morning and you're not a Christian, then you are in sin. You are still going the wrong way. You're going against God. You're still dead in your sin. You're still separated from sin. You haven't been made holy. You haven't been set apart from God. You are living in that rejection of God. But you don't have to remain there. We read earlier how Paul wrote to the Corinthians about how they used to be like that. And yet they turned away from their sin and turned to God. They admitted their need for forgiveness. They admitted that they needed Jesus. They needed to be regenerated. And they found that new birth in Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, then this is a chance to change that. You can confess your sin. You can trust in Jesus. You can talk to one of us about it after the service. Or even if you're not sure about it, you just want to ask questions about it. We'd love to talk to you about that. But now, right now, we can close in prayer. So pray with me. Father, we praise you for this life that we have in you, being regenerated by the power of your spirit. We praise you for the, the new birth that we were given by your spirit. We know that this is an act of grace and mercy. We did not earn it, but you gave it to us as a gift. You gave us the gift of repentance so that we could admit our need for Jesus. We could turn away from sin, not under our own power, but by the power of your spirit working in us. And when we trusted in Jesus, we were justified and we were sanctified. We were forgiven of all of our sins and we were brought into a relationship with Jesus and we belong to him. We know that this is the work of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit continues to work in our lives today, helping us to grow and to be more like Jesus over time. And we know that though we still sin, the Holy Spirit's work in us is not done and the Holy Spirit continues to draw us back, to lead us to repentance over and over again. And we look forward to the day when we will be in heaven and temptation will be gone, corruptibility will be gone, but we will just enjoy the presence and the blessings of Jesus for all time. And we praise his name. Amen. Amen.